Thank you, Abby, so much. Um, uh, I'm so excited to uh, be showing you around the show tonight. And uh, uh, this is uh, a wonderful experience for me. I've always wanted to uh, create a show in Apex Art or a, new, a, a public art show. And I am um, saddened I couldn't be with your beautiful faces today with wine in hand, showing you around the show itself, but I guess what we lose in uh, opportunities like that, we gain by the ability to participate or invite many of you from all around the world. And I'm so heartened to see people from all around the world. And I'd like to thank Apex Arts for doing a phenomenal job of like making curation so much easier and taking me through every step of the way in doing this. And I truly could not have done any of the work without them. Uh, I came to them with an, a simple idea and with some artists and they helped me kind of craft it into this wonderful show that I'm about to share with you. And I'm gonna start the show a little bit by telling you about the provenance of the idea of querying the Arab. When I first wrote the proposal, my aim was to create more space for a discussion of uh, queer uh, art, queer Arab art that discusses queer Arab identity. Uh, the word queer, I identify with a lot and I wanted to see what happens or what art is being produced to play with that, with these terms and kind of expand them and push them. Because for me, that is what art does. Art pushes and expands and asks us to reconsider our view of things. and. Um, as I delved into this, I realized quickly that every part of this, the show's title is problematic, meaning queer is a word that originally meant something peculiar, later on was described, used to describe gay people or homosexual activities, later on reclaimed by the LGBT community as an empowerment name, and later on even expanded more to mean anything that is non-normative or that is seeking or does not uh, abide by the limited rules that pre-exist, something more contemporary, so to speak. Um, and then uh, historically also, Arab culture has always has been viewed and described and sometimes as queer in itself. Now on the flip side, if you take the whole idea of queerness, that word existed and developed in the West. And how do you map that on an Eastern perspective? How do you identify, uh, map that on Arab identity? That's a little tricky. Uh, Arab culture has always had some comfort with the uh, um, homoerotic imagery. Uh, interestingly enough, as I delved into research about uh, homosexuality or homoeroticism in the Arab world, um, I realized that even the concept of homosexuality only existed in its current format in the last hundred years. There was homoeroticism before that, but they did not think of it in the same way. It was more has to do with power and those who control, who did, those who um, it was very reliant on who was in power and who did what to who. Interestingly enough, it turns out as I researched more that Arab uh, history had a lot of her, uh, space for uh, um, gay sexuality. And they even had terms for uh, what would be now considered different types of uh, gay men, tops and bottoms. <laughs> they had specific terms even back a, a thousand years ago. So uh, they had it termed even before Grindr did. Um, and I would like to start the show. This is an overview of what this show is going to look like. But I would like us to start at the beginning, at the doorstep, when you open the door for this show, as if I'm taking you into some sort of home, some, the gallery. So this is what happens. You step in through the door. And the first image you open up with is this image, two men sitting on the floor, one of them serenading the other. And it looks like a charming image. And uh, from an Arab perspective, this is a very problematic image because this is classically what was used to what would be termed as an Orientalist image, an image that would reduce the diversity in the Arab world into one single image. Um, 
It, but if you examine the image more closely, the man on the floor is waking, wearing a jock strap. He's wearing a kufiya, which is the traditional headdress. Uh, but there are two men. There's uh, sexuality there, uh, or homosexuality, or homoeroticism there. And what the uh, this is a piece by this wonderful, amazing artist Jamil Hillu, who's been such a joy to work with. And this piece is printed on a carpet and it's meant to be stepped on, to be changed as we enter and exit through this show, this image, the, the lines will be smeared, it will be filled with dirt and we collectively will change its meaning we, as we step on the taboo of gay imagery, as we change what we don't like about this Orientalist image. And so there is this, uh, wonderful redefinition of what is your role as a uh, viewer and what is the role of art in this space and this show is trying to really change our perception of what does the word queer mean what does the word art mean what is the relationship with art and so i wanted to push on that a little and then we're going to look at the first image you see when you walk in which is the title of the show, Queering the Arab. Next to Queering the Arab is this interesting image of this very hypersexualized girl in pink. And on her shirt, it says sukkar, which means sugar. And her hair is made out of candy. And her backpack says sugar in Japanese. And this is an example of um, uh, queer, non-homoerotic art that's made by uh, the artist for this one is uh, Egilis Manna, his other name is Osama. Many people will think of this as saying Obama. It actually says Osama. Um, but I find this is a very humorous, interesting way to start the show. We're gonna pan left now, and we're gonna start with an image that is so subtle, you could miss the, uh, the reason it's in the show. And this image is called Aman. It's by this anonymous queer uh, art collective that produces their imagery only online. These images are available on many different items, on sheets, on paintings, on posters, on stickers, whatever you want. Um, and that's the space that this collective has occupied. And if you look carefully there, it's a, simple scene from downtown Amman with people hanging the laundry. And if you are not careful, you could miss that moment of intimacy happening in between people's dirty laundry or washed laundry. And I love the intimacy of it, that gay life and gay existence happens in between the layers that a lot of us just disregard and don't see. Next to it, there are two images of uh, uh, three images of the uh, hairs, and they are the artists are trying to show us a desire to be viewed as finding love. Two women with a background of in an Arab city. Below that, two men that are supposed to be Arab. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, no Arab wears the red hat, the fez anymore, but this is what historically would have been viewed as Arab. So it's almost that the language in this image is designed for a Western gaze. So it's always interesting to see what this image is referencing. What is, who is it trying to engage? The upper right hand uh, image is a man smoking and the other man trying to uh, uh, charm him with a flower that's juxtaposed with the image under it of a vending machine and if you look carefully uh, what the vending machine is selling it's selling two Middle Eastern men one is called Ahmad and one is called Hassam and it is commenting on the universal uh, commodification of sexual uh, access in the gay world, how Grindr has become a dispensary for sexual access, whether in the East or the West, which is an example of how sometimes queer identity in different parts and cultures are very different, and sometimes they coalesce on the same idea. Um, there are some samplings of their imagery, uh, and we'll go back and look at a couple other more of their works. Uh, we're going to now almost do a 180 flip and we're going to look at the this corner here and it has 
four artists that are being shown at the same time. It just uh, an orientation and then we'll get a close up. To your right is a big image by Aguilis Manna. He's a wonderful uh, Algerian um, uh, German artist. Um, and Aguilis is a very interesting person to include in this uh, show. He identifies as Amgazi or Berber, but he speaks Arabic. And so the question is, how do you define even the term Arab? Is it people who speak Arabic? Is it people who identify as Arab? Is it people born in the Arab nation? Any of those terms, once you examine them too closely, will gradually disintegrate under your gaze. Um, and in this image, this is a reflection of how he is viewed uh, in the West. He always has been, he thinks that he's being asked to be, to come across as the brute, as the controller in a sexual fantasy that everyone wants him to be. And so he's this man who is strangling the man underneath them. He's brutish, he's like a sultan there. But if you look carefully, there's a chain in his neck and the chain is hanging very loosely from this uh, blue ribbon hanging from the man sitting beneath him. And so calls into question who's in control and the power dynamic of the sexual fantasies. Um, I find the contrast between this image and Elias Joaquim's work, which is now about 90 degrees to our left. Um, Elias is a wonderful uh, uh, Palestinian performance artist and he uh, his uh, artwork is uh, titled, uh, or um, it does a lot of work under the title or under the idea of resistance by mere existence. He's a Palestinian drag queen. Uh, his uh, traditional upbringing does not want him to be a drag queen and the political environment he lives in does not want him to be Palestinian. Uh, in this performance piece that he did, he, uh, it's called akide or wax and akide is a word in Arabic that can mean both faith and wax made out of sugar. And it references the phenomenon of removing hair to beautify oneself. It involves some pain and maybe some people would argue some beautification to become beautiful. It's a role reserved, it's a, it's a tradition usually reserved to women, but uh, Elias chooses to engage in it himself because he wants to beautify himself a lot of his imagery is about him being somewhere between uh, occupying a, a male space and a female space, somewhere in between the two. Um, I don't know if he identifies as non-binary, but he is exploring and playing with these different images. Uh, Elias will also have a performance art piece coming as part of the public arts program for this show. And if we take a step out back away a little, uh, and we're going to swing to the right and then the left. To the right, you can see a mannequin wearing a kilt. And this kilt is made out of a material that is traditionally associated with a kufiya or the Arabic headscarf that is predominant in the Levant and the Arabian Peninsula. And that, uh, that kufiya is a, one of my pieces. And my idea behind it was, I no longer have need of use of that kufiya, especially in a place like New York. However, uh, I decided to, I asked myself, what if we repurpose that pattern to something useful? And I thought about making pants out of it or a jacket, but I finally decided that I wanted to make something that truly gives me the queer space to be whatever I want to be, to kind of push against all the boundaries of what I should be, to allow me to be something that no one's defined. So I took the idea of a kilt and I added with it the pattern of an Arab headdress and that gives you what? I don't know, but it's something that is mine that it, it can identify me, that I feel captures the energy between uh, male energy, but some fluidity of female energy and is Arab by some token of it. In a, in a weird way, or it, in a very simplistic way, it is a queer garment because it combines so many different things. I want us now to kind of walk a little closer to the bedroom and we're gonna take a quick look at this bedroom. And if you are someone who's 
who knows me or has been to my house, this might remind you of my uh, abode. I am someone who's a maximalist in my hanging. And I think I wanted a space that it represents uh, a bedroom where many of the objects that Queer Habibi and other artists the carpets are all by Jamil Hulu are represented because that is where a lot of the queer fantasy and creativity happens. There isn't that much space for queer Arab identity to exist in. And the bedroom is one of the few places that we have. If you look at the tables, it's populated with things that you would find in a, um, uh, in a classical, in an Arab bedroom and in a queer bedroom. There's an image out there of Elias Wakim, half man, half woman, and all these little pieces here and there. And I want to draw your attention to the, uh, the drag queen in red in the middle of that. And it, the title of this piece, this has multiple layers of, uh, of humor in it. The title of this piece is, it's, it's um, the drag queen Anya Knees, which I'm assuming everyone gets the joke there. But at the same time, if you look at her shirt or her swimsuit, it says in Arabic, Nizlis Semak, which means um, here comes the fish or the fish has descended. And it is a reference to RuPaul's Drag Race because if you've ever watched RuPaul, RuPaul on RuPaul's Drag Race, fishiness is an attribute that a drag queen possesses or does not possess. And it references how close she is to being, to passing or being close to a woman. And if, I find it fascinating that there's an Arab reference on this, in this uh, um, image to RuPaul's Drag Race, again, showing you the connection between the dialogue within the queer culture in East and West. I'm gonna turn our attention now 90 degrees to the big pink triangle with the image, the white image next to it. And that's a, that's by uh, uh, Jamil Hillo again. And Jamil uh, the, uh, came up with the idea of the pink triangle. And the pink triangle, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is the symbol that the Nazis used to brand uh, or place on gay individuals when they were being taken to concentration camps. And the LGBTQ community has taken it and repossessed it. Uh, and is proud of it and uses it to highlight their uh, pride. And you can see there uh, uh, Jamil's face wrapped in a kufi and in a leather jacket, both uh, parts of his identity, looking at us, defying us, saying, like contrasting what the pink triangle used to say that we were being persecuted to being, to being proud and being able to hold your gaze and uh, challenge you to kind of uh, not give us space to exist. Uh, this is contrasted to the left by a few series of humorous images by queer Habibi. And one of them is to the left is Baghdadi. And it's a reference to an, uh, a terrorist in Baghdad. But for most Arab speakers, Baghdadi simply means a man from Baghdad. It's also a play on the word daddy, which is a very particular gay trope. Uh, on the upper right, there are two men with an illicit affair there. And in the lower, the small print below the image, there's a young man who's looking at men's magazine with his mom walking in on him. And every single of the, one of the queer Habibis has under it the word hope, which means love, which I find so endearing and wonderful. Um, and it really captures how all these images are supposed to represent different forms of us being uh, loving each other or being in love. Um, uh, I want us now to uh, turn around about 180 degrees and focus on the biggest wall in this uh, uh, show, which is the big pink wall. That wall is a... Uh, a particular iteration of a work by Jamil Hillu. Uh, it's called the story of ABCDE. And the story, and these are the different elements that go into forming a person's identity. And these range from as simple as uh, a 
ocean, the back of a head. There's a lovely buttocks with a rainbow a square around it. There's a reference to Pee Wee Herman humorously being the light switch. The black uh, square there with a hole in the center of it is supposed to be a uh, reference to a glory hole. Um, and to the right of the square, the square is supposed to represent gay culture. And then to the right of the square, there's a double image of a child that transcends the squares. Because truly, if you think about it, it does gay culture capture all that is gay? What is a child that has some um, gay uh, or some uh, attributes that we associate with gayness? Uh, does he fall within gay identity or not? And these are all different elements that are bubbling within a personality. They're in the middle of them, there's a screen. And what that screen says, it's a letter from, it's based on a real letter from a mom to her son, uh, trying to understand him and reflecting on him. And if you, uh, where is it? One second. Uh, and if you guys, uh, I would like to read you that letter because every time I read that letter, looking at these images, I think of her looking at all these images, understanding her son and realizing who he is. And she says, dear son, I knew and I must tell you that I've prayed for many years that I was wrong. That now that you have divulged your secret to us, I can handle it. It took considerable courage to compose that letter and I am aware of the fact, of that fact. And you know, son, I constantly seek refuge and answers in my faith. And I am comforted in the fact that God made you. And if he chose to make you gay, then it's all right with me. My only sadness is that you may suffer. But the mission of things, children, families, etc., the commission of other things, uh, scurrilous remarks, intolerance, etc. It is gratifying to me to know that you are happy. Stay that way. For years, my friends have told me that you are my favorite child. If that is so, you still are. I love you, son. Maybe even more now, mom. And every time I read that letter, it makes me choke up because it makes me think of my own experience and how it is simple to reduce one person to one title, whether it's you're gay, you're Arab, you're an immigrant, you're different. But there are so many layers among us that are loved by so many and hated by so many. And this show is about showing to us that we are all many layers and we need different spaces to exist and be. Um, I hope this gave you a little bit of space to uh, explore different ways of being for queer Arab artists. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a brilliant tour and really wonderful and what a um, kind of emotional um, uh, moment to kind of end on and rest on. Um, thank you. Uh, Earl of Bushwick, we are so excited to kind of get to walk through this space with you. Um, we do have a few moments for questions. We are here for another 15 minutes together. Um, so I invite our audience to um, you know, it, put a question in the chat uh, if you have any. Um, and also if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question, we can open that up as well. Just let us know also in the chat. Um, I will give a few moments because I know it, it takes some time to um, gather your thoughts. In the meantime, um, the Earl of Bushwick, I'd, would you like to share a little bit about yourself um, and your uh, name and kind of curatorial um, and art background? I, I'd love to hear that as, as we're collecting questions. Well, I actually originally was gonna, thank you for that question. I was gonna mention that I am, um, I choose that title, Earl of Bushwick, uh, because um, the consequences of curating such a show and the freedom it entails to have that the title um, 
are important to me. My daytime job is a surgeon and maybe at this point in my life, I'm not comfortable uh, sharing my queer arts career with my patients. I also come from the Middle East and I think of the repercussions of me being known for my queer art show and its influence on my family. And for anyone who wants to critique me, I will agree with you, that is a form of self-closeting, but it also allows me freedoms of being as an artist, as free as I want to express somewhat uh, risque and interesting uh, to make interesting artistic choices. And so um, for, the, for the time being, that is a, a name that I uh, enjoy and love. And interestingly enough, it is more than that. It's not, I, uh, for a lot of my friends who know me and love me, that is a name they associate very intimately with me. Um, my art practice uh, is very varied. It's performative. There's a lot of visual stuff, but um, I'm finding my um, most uh, enjoyable art practice has to do with social intervention and people. Thank you. And um, you know, I'm relating a lot of what you say there too to um, even how you describe this exhibition as you know, a space of, of your own, a space of one's own, um, a space um, to kind of be oneself, um, which really comes through. Um, and I'll add a question that um, was put in the chat by Stephen, um, uh, mentioning that you know they don't have kids, but if uh, they did, this is a show that they could bring them to. Um, it doesn't feel like it's rough. It, was that an intentional uh, choice? To not make kind of a, a rough show. I don't know, Stephen, if you wanted to expand on that. Well, I mean, it's the image not a for kids. Uh, kind of show that you can bring to and talk to, uh, about the image. Uh, and under or you aesthetic your sense or that these are the images most attractive. Um, I, you know, it's interesting that the show had started off initially with the, there's one of the carpets that's next to the bed with two men embracing with their buttocks showing as you entered. And I wanted people to kind of like, that was more the defined way of showing queer spaces, but I wanted people to enter the way we enter there because most people enter it because they want to follow love, they want to find companionship. And so that's when I changed it and I positioned the, the opening with something I love, which is Amman where I grew up. And uh, I wanted it to lead with images of love. And uh, there is some kind of pushing here and there, the carpets on the floor, I do kind of like a little, there's some of them that have sexual interactions and nudity like this one here the man um the one under achilles there's a man reaching into the other man's pants and giving him um some uh, uh, assistance in his predicament um but there's also humor in them there are two naked men and a dog in between them which kind of brings like i love humor as a way to allow us to overcome some difficult imagery for some of us and to allow us to interact with the show better. Wonderful. I appreciate that too. There's, it's, again, as you said, so many layers um, within the show and um, I imagine spending so much time within this space too. And the longer you spend with all these works together, uh, kind of the more you get to glean or see or um, ask questions about. And again, query. Um, I know that's a, a big thorough line um, of the exhibition is really looking at these words and what they mean from all different angles and places and personhoods. Um, 
but it looks like we have a, a, a quieter bunch on the on the chat um, and we are kind of coming up against our 645 um, ending but wanting to celebrate and kind of end on a really positive note we have a lot of um, wonderful comments that I'll just read aloud um, from the chat just um, to kind of fill the space of this is such an amazing show bravo beautiful lots of thank yous um, and just wanting to thank our audience as well for for sharing um, along with us. Um, I'll give just another moment for a question, but otherwise um, we will wrap up shortly. Um, unless there's another word from you, um, Earl. Um, if there are no other questions, I just am so grateful to see so many beautiful faces and names that have supported me through uh, uh, my journey of like trying of being simultaneously a physician and an artist. And uh, um, you know, you guys believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. And so I'm grateful for having you in my life. Thank you. <laughs>